So my mother, Rita Rogers, who's a painter and a printmaker, likes to tell a story about my early childhood. And apparently I started to read at a pretty young age. Not crazy young, but pretty young. So I was not a huge person when this story takes place. And I ran into her studio, really excited, and I declared, Mom, I want to be useless. My mother sagely, I think, responded, what? And I tried to explain it to her, and she couldn't really make heads or tails of it. And apparently this went on for months, a long time. Telling anybody who would listen that, yeah, Batman is cool, but when I grow up, I really want to be useless. I, it's, that's what I want to be. And finally, apparently a breakthrough came at dinner one night with my very large family. So I was probably screaming at the top of my tiny little lungs so someone would hear me. And I was talking about a teeny. I said, a teeny what? And I said, no, 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 a teeny, a teeny, the goddess who helps useless to get home to his wife, Penny Lope, and blind the cyclops and, you know, do all the cool things that he does and have the adventures. And, oh, yeah, Andrew, no, it's pronounced Ulysses, not useless. So I was pretty obsessed with ancient Greek mythology and with Greek vases, which are so helpfully covered in in comic strips, basically, and I was reading when I, this story happened, a children's version of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and for those of you who don't know why that might have been a funny story <laughs> to my family, uh, let me tell the story a little bit. So Ulysses is what the Romans called Odysseus, who was a figure in Greek mythology, who was a king of an island called Ithaca in the Aegean, and he went away with lots of other kings, Menelaus and Agamemnon and Achilles, to Troy to kill the Trojans and defeat Troy. Uh, and they went off and had great battles and accomplished heroic deeds. And Ulysses came up with the ruse that won the war, the Trojan horse. You probably heard about that. And then the war was over and he decided he would go home with his men and immediately runs into trouble, which is actually what his name Odysseus means, trouble. And he's blown off course and he loses some men to lotus eaters where they eat a fruit and forget. And he loses some men to a cyclops, a giant with one eye, who eats them. And he puts the eye out and they get away and he stupidly tells the cyclops his name so that the cyclops' father, who's the king of the sea, can, you know, put a hit on him. And he loses men to the cannibalistic Lystragonians and he has all of these adventures. He lives with a few different women at various times. And then finally he gets a ride home and he discovers that none of that really mattered. And now he has the real challenge to accomplish, which is fighting off a cadre of suitors for his wife's hand because he was presumed dead. And he manages to do that with the help of a goddess, Athena, and takes back his position, reclaims his identity. And when I was young, I loved the stories of adventures, and I loved the stories of the monsters, and I loved the action. And I've been reading it throughout my life because I really enjoy it. And I read it a couple times a year, probably. And as I've gotten older, you know, I came to see the sort of extended metaphor about life, that he's just trying to get something done. And all these obstacles keep coming up, and he has to surmount them, and then another obstacle comes up, and then he's got to do something else. And all these things which are seen as heroic actions are just him responding to this nonsense that crops up in his way when he's trying to accomplish something. You know, living his life. Shit happens. We can understand that, I think. So I didn't grow up to be Ulysses, but I certainly do a lot of useless things in my life. And I bet you do too. Um, I really like playing video games or any kind of game, board games, when I get the chance. Anybody else? Yeah. And uh, uh, does anyone get paid to play video games? Yeah, me neither. Not yet. <laughs> and um, I like to meditate. I've been doing this since I was quite young as well, because again, my mom. And I... Uh, I enjoy doing that a lot. I don't think I do it very well, but I do it all the time. I, I, I really enjoy the structure and I enjoy the activity. Anybody else enjoy meditating? Yeah? Anybody get paid? To, no religious professionals here? So uh, I also, I like playing music. I play guitar and I love practicing guitar. I don't think I play very well. And every time that I get technically a little more proficient, my ear gets better and I can hear how bad I am. Uh, and my understanding of musical theory gets a little bit better, and I can understand how much I don't know, and I can see what the people I like are doing, and I can't do that, and I can't make myself, but I really enjoy it. I enjoy the structure. I enjoy the form. I enjoy the activity. I really get something from it. Does anyone practice a, an instrument here? Yeah? 
Now, I know we have some people who actually play instruments for a living here, and I think that's a slightly different feeling, right? I also like playing sports with my friends, like when I can. And we probably, a lot of you do, too. We have some team sports, yeah. We have a professional athlete, too, and we're going to hear from her. But I don't profit from any of these things. There is no material interest involved. I get a lot of worth out of them. They have a lot of worth to me. But there is no profit to be gained. And yet I do them. And going back to Ulysses for a moment, as I grew older, I started to realize that he spends a lot of his time, in fact, about three quarters of his time doing things that don't really benefit him in, in the slightest way. He's bumbling around. He's operating without a map. He's meeting new people and talking to them and learning lots of things that bear no material interest on what eventually happens because eventually he gets home and there's a, a challenge which cannot be helped by any of the things that he learned along the way. He's a very different human being by the time he gets there and he responds in a very different way, but he bears none of the fruits of his labor in order to help him there, right? And I think we probably can understand that feeling. All that useless stuff that I was just talking about, a lot of that shows you all sorts of things as you do it, doesn't it? I mean, you start to see aspects of yourself or aspects of the world around you, you just learn something new. And there is no material interest, there is no profit to be gained, but there's a lot of discovery. And I think there's a lot of worth and so I think we have a sense of that. So I don't really know why we all fall prey to this sort of drive to commoditize things that have worth. You know, it's hard to read an online publication, and I'm not going to name names, but you read lots of online publications, the one we go to every day, and we try to learn about industry, and we try to learn about business. And there's always that headline that says, if you want to be a better business leader, you should meditate five minutes every day. And if you want to make as much as a wolf on Wall Street, you should play this game this way. And now I'm a, ch I'm a, I'm a child. <laughs> I, I have children. I'm a father of small children. And I find it increasingly hard. I find it really, really hard not to co-opt their experience, not to structure their play so that they get some benefit out of it, so that they learn some lesson from it, so that they can profit from it at some point in their lives because I want them to do well. But playing isn't necessarily concerned with profit. And I don't think discovery happens unless you're in a state of mind where you're willing to see something that you don't already see, where you're willing to hear something new, where you're willing to know something that you don't already know, right? The thing is, your brain doesn't really like that. I got a chance recently to meet Stanislav Bachrock, who is a neuroscientist who spent time in Harvard and now is back in his native Argentina working in Latin America as an innovation process consultant. And it was great because he got to give me, he was able to give me lots of data and research about things about which I'm very interested, which is sort of the way the brain works and creativity. And this is the stuff that I work in as a consultant. And we were talking about how it sort of seems to the research now that you use about 2% of your brain at any given time. You use different 2% for different things, but for the 60,000, 70,000 or so thoughts that you have every day, about 95% of those seem to be the same as the ones you had yesterday. And yesterday, about 95% of those were the same as the ones you had the day before. And it sort of makes sense if you think of Evolution having created a brain which favors efficiency. I mean, we're running on 40 watts of energy here. We don't have a dynamo whirring away, crunching numbers, right? So your brain is happy to use any of the paths that it's already trod. It doesn't want to blaze a new trail because that's hard. It requires work. So ambiguity is really not an optimal situation for the brain. And your mind, your thoughts, your emotions loves learning new things. It loves uncertainty. It loves putting two different ideas to get it together and getting a new third one. And so your mind asks your brain to do the work. And your brain doesn't really want to, so it fights back using the tools that the mind has, which is your thoughts and your emotions. And you feel doubt or discomfort. I feel kind of uncomfortable about these questions and this ambiguity. And it really wants you to get to a place where it's on solid ground. And conclusions, answers, 
functionality, those are mental models that make sense. Those work for us. We're constantly looking for them. And so taking something that has worth and we're not really sure why and saying, listen, there must be some functionality to it is great for your brain, right? But in working for the past few years with thousands and thousands of people, really, no kidding, and a lot of you in the room here tonight, professionals and students and participants in different workshops and things, we've discovered, I think you'll agree with me, that while you might make some kind of profit from something that you discover, you might discover something which you are able to then turn to your profit somehow. If you don't do the exploration and make discoveries, there is no profit. Think back to the, your last project, the last project that you had, professional, personal, academic. Odds are you got about four-fifths of the way through, and then you and your team realized, that's it. That's the question. That's what we should have been asking all the way back there in the beginning. Or that's the solution that we should have been developing. Or that's the value we should have been delivering. Or that is the thing that we're excited about. But you have no time left. And your brain would be really, really happy if you just go ahead and deliver what you've been working on all this time anyway. Because it doesn't want to do all the rush. And it doesn't want to go back in the time that you have and do all the work again. But your mind is excited. This is a great thing. This is an exciting thing. This is what we want to work on. It doesn't matter we don't have time. We'll get it done because this is really valuable. And so you can't give way to the laziness of your brain, right? And it's hard. <laughs> it's hard work. I think it's one of the reasons that we like TED Talks so much because it's really satisfying to be given an idea or a solution or learn about something and your brain says, oh, that's great. Fantastic, I'm smarter, I'm inspired, I feel good, I didn't have to do anything. I sat here for 18 minutes and I'm better. This is great, my mind is gonna be happy. And very often our mind is happy and we leave it there, right? But if you're curious about the data I was just talking about, do the work, go look it up, check my facts. How do you know I'm right? Maybe I'm making this all up off the top of my head. You have to do the work in order to make any discovery of your own. Right? And I feel like there's a real push-pull situation that we're in right now, sort of, particularly many of us in the room here today. In order to be discovered, we have to spend a lot of time and energy creating our digital life, our digital identity, right? And it takes so much time and energy to create this digital identity that there's not a lot of time left for the discovery of ourself, offline, and who we really are. So we do it and we put the energy in and then there's a wrinkle, right? Because it's kind of like buying your first set of professional clothes. This is great, I'm ready, but I can't wear these for the rest of my career. I have to keep putting in the time and the energy. I need to keep updating the profile and putting the stuff up there and, and, and making sure people see it so I can get the next job, so I can work on a project that interests me, so I get involved with people that are interesting to me, right? So in a way, really, what I'm here to say is that you now have permission. You have permission. Do it. You have to build your digital life. You have to do that work. But the harder work and the more important work is going to happen offline, and it is going to look useless. It's going to look useless to the rest of the world. It's going to feel useless to you. But it's going to be the most important work that you do. So shaking up the order often makes us think of grand, dramatic gestures. And we're going to hear about some really dramatic things today. But I also want you to keep in mind, maybe, whether there isn't an internal order that is also ripe to be shaken up. The way that we process, the way that we get used to things, the defaults that we, that we fall back to. And that could be shaken up in much quieter and more persistent ways. And ways, I think, that are more helpful in propelling us along a journey of exploration, which sounds very cheesy, but let's go with it, right? So a journey of exploration into this experience of what it means to be human in the world, which really at the end of the life is probably the only kind of experience that we're going to have. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. <laughs>